Hello and welcome along to the RTE Rugby Podcast. A rare empty weekend is behind us, but that doesn't mean we're light on talking points. The Investec Champions Cup is back this weekend. All four provinces in action on Saturday. We'll get to that shortly. Bernard Jackman and Johnny Murphy are with me today. And Bertha Major, come down for, for you after you were mingling with the great and good of, of rugby last night. Tell us about your your evening with Mac Hansen and Stephen Kitchoff and a few others. Mac must have been barely Mac must have been barely out of his hospital bed after the, the shoulder surgery. Tell us yeah. tell us what no, you were doing last night. I, w- I wouldn't swap these for the world, lads, but it, they were they were good <laughs> to be fair. Um no the um big gym show was in the Sugar Club in Dublin last night. Um and they had uh yeah, Stephen Kitchoff came down um, from Ulster. He had a day off today. Uh, and then Mac Hansen is a Red Bull athlete. Uh, in fairness, in a sling. I, like, he hadn't slept for, I think, 48 hours. Uh, like, it's tip. It's typical of him that he actually went ahead and did it. I don't I don't know many other rugby players who would have um, not just cancelled. He had a genuine excuse to, to cancel, but it was um, it was for charity. Um, is a, a Red Bull are launching a... A run in May, and um, and then they got uh, Jack Nowell and Sia Khaleesi, who are both Red Bull ambassadors, on a Zoom call. Um, and it was it was great fun. Uh, everyone was everyone's in good form. Uh, Jim is uh, he's a good host, and um, yeah, we had a bit of crack in in a in in front of a good crowd in, in the Sugar Club. But uh, no lads, you know, I, I I I'm very happy to be here this morning. <laughs> <laughs> and Mac is um. Was he in good spirits? Uh, in fairness, after all, yeah, the, he was. Uh, he got tired, to be fair, but he's had he's the, a character. Had the, had the painkillers wore off. Yeah, I think um, <laughs> he said he was on morphine yesterday, um, which was which helped him. But I think that was starting to wear off. Uh, look, in fairness to the guy, I think he was just looking forward to getting back to to Galway and and um, getting some rest. I think he's going to be out for the guts of three months. Um, so I, hopefully, I don't know. Connor obviously will have will discuss it with him, but it'd be nice for him to get back to Australia. I reckon, you know. Um, mm. And see some families, etc. Because obviously, they were they had a big build up to the World Cup, and uh, he's had an unbelievable rise. He's only 25, 26 uh, in March. I mean, um, when you consider that he actually had a slow start to his professional career, what he's achieved in the last two years is is phenomenal. And um, yeah, you you'd have to think as well. There's way more in him, you know, because uh, obviously he was playing ten, he was playing sevens. Um, had got a lot of game time, and now obviously he's found his his feet, whether it's a fullback or a wing. Um, and both the green of Connaught and the green of Ireland, um, he's been used a lot. So, uh, yeah, he, he's he, he's going to be uh, a, 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 a continue to be an exciting player for a long time. Yeah, and Johnny, it's it's remarkable, just like the timing of it as well, where you just think about it. It kind of leads us into the first topic. I was going to talk about obviously the fact that he has that injury and Jimmy O'Brien as well, but. It's incredible to think when you look at Mac Hansen's story, this time two years ago, he was just about to be called up to the Six Nations squad for the for the first time and a few weeks short of, of winning his first cap. And if you if you think about how quickly he's established himself as an absolute lock in that number 14 jersey when fit, it's been a not just remarkable two and a half years, but even particularly just how quickly he took to to test rugby, let alone took to rugby in Ireland. Yeah, I think, look, it's a credit to kind of his talent and also how in, you know, uh, what a good individual he is. People like characters. Um, and I think that's been a big part of his rise as well because he, you know, he's, um, you know, like little things that he does. He's been on, obviously, I'd listen to, would have played with Jim and Goody. So I listened to the rugby pod every week. He's been on that, you know, the tattoos he has, you know, the lit different bets and he's very open and honest with everyone. And in this day and age that probably, you know, there's not enough of that and we need more characters like him in the game. And I think that's probably helped his kind of, you know, his rise because everyone's intrigued about what type of character he is, but he's backed everything that he has, you know, he, he's backed all of that up on the pitch by his performances um, you know, when you look back at moments over the last 18 months, you know, the catch of the kickoff in France um, to then, you know, his footballing ability in the middle of the park where he's pulling out of their shape and he's kicking cross fields into people's hands. Um, and then obviously his finishing ability. Um, he's just obviously he has one of the he reminds me kind of a bit like kind of Jordan Murphy in terms. He just has this skinny strength, you know, like that. <laughs> takes people on and and he comes out the right the right side of it um physically um even though he was joking on the 
big gym show a couple of weeks about the meme that Ant himself and Anton de Pont have um uh, when he got manhandled by Anton de Pont. <laughs> yes. He um you know, yeah, he's just he's a great character and he's an even better rugby player. Um and it's just so unfortunate that um, you know, at a time where we were really keen to get our you know, to see him back in our Ireland shirt um to get that injury, but you know, hopefully he comes back bigger, better and stronger. Yeah, and that leads us into the the main question then. Mac Hansen out for the Six Nations. There was about a two about a two hour window on Monday when I was thinking, do you know what? In fairness, Jimmy O'Brien has deserved this shot now. He was really, really good in the World Cup when he came out against New Zealand and has always put in a good shift for Ireland uh when he'd been picked over the over the previous year. And I was saying, fair play to him, this will be his shot now for the Six Nations. He deserves that 14 jersey. He's obviously ruled out as well for the next few months with that that neck injury. So Bert, it leads us to and Keith Earl's retirement as well, throw it in on top of that. So you've got three of the World Cup back three squad unavailable for the Six Nations. So then the question is, who wears number 14 for that opener in France, in Marseille? Yeah, I think Jimmy's Jimmy's injuries is is a is a big blow because we didn't um you know we didn't really see it uh happen or come, whatever, whereas you saw Mac go off at the end, and then obviously James Lowe is coming back. Hopefully this weekend they're getting closer, but like it was looking very, very weak for Andy Farrell in terms of that back three selection. Obviously Conway was someone who was in the picture up till you know uh, a season or two ago. Obviously he's gone as well. Um, I'm not I'm not really sure who 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 goes in there. I mean obviously, um, you have your your two Ulster wingers Balakloon, who was you know uh part of the the World Cup preps, um Stockdale, um. But it's it's uh it's 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 it's, it's difficult for Farrell because our wingers are so important to how we play. So you you, you know you, you were losing a ten, and, and obviously we're going to talk about that, or that'll be the talking point. But effectively, if you think about how influential our wingers have been, stepping up a first receiver, second receiver, and helping Sexton um have balance to his play or keeping a, a blind side honest. Um it's a lot. And obviously my cat is is moving on. Um so you know he's he send him out in a height for their attack to stay at the level it was, which is up there the best in the world. Um it's gonna be it's gonna be difficult. Yeah and Johnny it's one of those where there there are plenty of candidates but there doesn't seem to be one standout candidate. No, and that's one of the ones, but that creates opportunity for the other guys. You know, there's someone like, you know, you know, obviously Jacob Stockdale comes back in. Are they going to go with two Ulster guys? Or, you know, Shane Daly's obviously been involved um, before under Andy Farrell. Um, you know, uh, Calvin Nash, Jordan Larmer. You know, these guys, there's opportunity there for these guys that have been involved before, but... It's who fits that bill, and I think Birch is bang on. It's it's what the wingers have created for us. Um, outside of being that kind of second set of hands or popping up, like we said, like with our earlier on, like Mac Hansen being in behind shape, being able to pass, um, as well as cross field from the middle of the park, um, th- those wingers that are left in probably aren't those types of players. Um, in the sense that they're more kind of out and out finishers and popping up on the ball, uh, being active off their wing on the inside, running trail lines. So there is going to be a bit of a shift towards um towards that, given the type of players that 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 they are. But yeah, like you said, there's four guys that you've mentioned that probably would have fit those bills: Erzy Conway, uh, Hansen, and Jimmy. You know, though they now are. Are are gone for this block. So who fits in? It's a you have to say Stockdale is probably in 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 the front of everyone, but it's who who fits who fits the the other slot and um and and where they go from there with the bench then as well. They're probably going to have you know one of um you know Robbie or, or you know one of the centre pairings on the bench. Is that when something happens then? Is Gary Ringrose, which has happened before, that he moves on to the wing, um. And where does Frawley fit into this in a back three three movement too? You know, well that team- you know, if low if low is out if low is out, and we need two new wingers, you may see ringer on the on a wing. I was yeah. gonna. I was just about that. I was just about to ask that. How, I wouldn't um, be. I wouldn't be massively uh, fond of that. I, I understand him moving there to you know to facilitate uh, Robbie coming on or whatever. But I, I think 
he like realistically when you're that far down, he may go for someone like Ring Rose, who he, he, he obviously knows really well. I think going back to I mentioned Stockdale and Balakloon, if they're looking for like for like, probably the two Munster wingers, Nash and, and Daly, are suited more by how Munster play. You know, it's uh Munster do use them. Uh, in a similar-ish way to how Ireland try and use their wingers, it's not as evident, and and they don't, um, they don't sometimes have the the moments that Mac or, or James Lowe have. But they, whereas for me, Balakun and and um, and and Stockdale are are more traditional wingers, um, so that that may help them to Munster lads' case, um, in, in, but I I don't I think if Lowe's fit, then I think you just you see Ringrose as a, as a thirteen. And and you pick another winger, but if if Lowe's out, he may try and he may try and you only only bring one winger in if 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 that makes sense. I do think that if Lowe's out, then Stockdale will definitely start yeah. because of left foot, um, you know that is a kind of a like for like there with their left foot and their exits and how they use use him, um. But if he's involved, then that probably there's more of a toss up then for Stockdale with the other with the other three that are are in the mix. Yeah, and to follow up then on that, so if, if James Lowe gets through this weekend and next weekend and gets some nice minutes under his belt and Andy Farrell thinks he's he's ready to go for Marseille, does that take Stockdale out of the equation because of how little we've we've seen him down the years on the right wing? And how and how, how I suppose how uh how well suited he is skills wise to the to the left side of the pitch given his left foot. And you know, that's it's it's just the, the position we've always seen him in for Ulster. Well, I think he is quite, he is left side dominant. So, you know, that's one of the things that being on the left wing kind of suits having two left footers on your wings is, can be a bit tricky to manage in terms of on the sideline when you're running down, if you have chip options, it's very hard for someone to to do that. Do you look then at Stockdale as a 15 option or, you know, it's kind of for me, it's 15 or wing for, for Stockdale. I think probably daily if, low is fit probably fits that kind of out and out right winger he's played a bit of 15 he's got a really good skill set um and he has been involved he understands the system he's been involved before so that would probably be be where where i'd be at so i think it does just depend on whether low is going to get through and if they feel that his fitness is up to task then we'll have two games if he can play this weekend and the weekend that might be enough for him but um yeah so it's it's one of those ones. Yeah, it's a really, really interesting call. And I suppose we'll get a, a sense of how Andy Farrell is thinking when he names that squad this day next week. A um, couple of other bits around around the Ireland squad and Andy Farrell as well. Um, tweet from Ashling M. Who's your Ireland captain and why? Who's coming in to replace Johnny Sexton? And and I suppose then to follow up on that, is are there any other surprises you're expecting in the, whatever we're, we're expecting, maybe 36, 37 man squad? Um, I think there's a growing rumor that Doris is very much in the running to be captain. Yeah, and you you, you mentioned that uh, on last week on the radio yeah. last week. Yeah, yeah, and I haven't I haven't got any phone calls to tell me should should up whatever. <laughs> I'm totally wrong, but that that could come that could come next week. Um, look, I'm not saying he is going to be captain, but he's definitely definitely seems to be um a contender. Um, no, I, I yeah, I, I, it's. I don't know. Is it just me, or is it kind of, um, or is it a little bit worrying our squad? Um, you know, when I when I look at what France will be able to put in, um, just with Peter being injured, Connor, Connor hasn't played a huge amount. Um, Porter's played a lot. Tyg obviously has hasn't played much. Um, obviously Max injury. James Lowe having not played. Jimmy's injury. Um, replacing Johnny. Uh yeah, I'm 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 a little bit worried going into this, but look, we have good, we will have good consistency. We you know um got good coaches, but yeah, I don't know. I'm um I'm looking forward to seeing the squad and seeing what talent Farrell has seen that has caught his eye and and be part of this rebuild. How are you feeling, Johnny? Uh yeah, on captaincy, I don't know. I think he's probably going to go down a route of someone that he thinks could get to the next World Cup. So that's I don't think that necessarily that's Pete's going to get that call because it's you know he's looking at an overall block for four years. Is Pete going to get to the next World Cup? Maybe, but it's not necessarily guaranteed. Um, 
Um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see where that goes um, on that one. From a squad perspective, I think, yeah, we've lost, you know, obviously there's been, you know, retirements and then injuries at the moment. But with that, there's guys that are still good rugby players that are going to get an opportunity to play. And I think the spine of the team, um, obviously bar probably, you know, without Johnny, but, you know, from, you know, hooker to second row to eight, uh, nine with Gibson Park, you have the two centres, um, full back, the spine of the team is still, you know, world class and would be a lot of the guys that got us to world number one. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't be as confident as we would have been in previous years. Um, but you know, three home games, the two difficult away games, um, you know, it's still I'm not sure by the grand slam. I'd still be very, you know, they'd be going into the last weekend maybe with a chance of winning it, you know. Um, but that's kind of where I'd be, where I'd be on it. Yeah, and I suppose Birch, like when it comes to the to the worries where you're talking about the. The players that are probably missing, you know, like Johnny Sexton, obviously we knew wasn't going to be there. Keith Earl's gone. And you mentioned Peter O'Mahony, who's been injured, has only played one game since the World Cup. James Lowe hasn't played since the World Cup yet. Ty Furlong's been away for, for personal reasons. Conor Murray hasn't seen too much game time. On on the flip side, like there's the element we were always going to come to this point and you may as well just kind of go in on the deep end in it. Is there yeah, an element to that? No, no, hundred percent. But like, what players who haven't, who aren't first choice for Ireland, have been absolutely pulling up trees for the for the provinces? Do you know what I mean? Like, there's like the reason we're not. There's no big push. Usually, there's a big push for someone who's come from outside the squad that his form warrants, you know, um, hype or expectation or inclusion. I, I I'm struggling to to think of that, and and the problems haven't been going. Um, terribly badly. Like Ulster, good for the last three games. Leinster have been pretty good. Obviously, they lost two this season, but they've been tipping away. Uh, Connacht had a bit of a, had a bit of a blip, and obviously Munster are in a bit of trouble. But it, even within that, individually, like that's that's the thing. I'm I'm kind of struggling to see who has put their hand up. Like that's why I'm fascinated to see Farrell's squad because I think he is a good selector. You know, I think he saw he saw something in Gibson Park a couple of years ago um, uh, that suited the way Ireland want to play and, and obviously that worked out. He saw something in Mac quite quickly. You know, James Lowe, he re- rehabilitated him from being an Irish international to being dropped to being back in and, and, and being a much more rounded player. Um, and he can definitely get the best out of players but just without his influence, I just, yeah, I've been, Joe McCarthy's obviously, he's probably the one. Joe McCarthy, to be fair, has had um and Tom Ahern, they're two, yeah. they're the two fellows. But I, I expect them to be in, if you know what I mean. Um, uh, and will Tom Ahern, will Tom Ahern start ahead of Doris O'Mahony if he's fit? Um, Josh Van Der uh, Conan, you know that's the, the, the. I'm not sure he will straight away. Will Joe McCarthy start? Um, ahead of Henderson, James Ryan. I think he'd be in the 23 anyway, but uh, yeah, so you know what I mean? So, bar him and Tom Ahern, there hasn't been anyone who's really just blown me away. I think Jack Crowley has been very steady and, and you know, he's proven that he's the guy who'll start at, at 10. But, yeah, uh, maybe I'm being harsh, but just, and I've been at a lot of games, just haven't gone, hop, hop, hop my car, go up the road, going, well, can we see him in green, this, this Six Nations? Mm. Um, The final point around around Ireland before we move on to this weekend's games and this weekend's topics tomorrow um we're expecting the the worst kept secret in rugby to be announced Andy Farrell to be confirmed as the the Lions coach for the 2025 tour of Australia um Johnny a good thing or not a good thing the critics would say that you're kind of giving away the state secrets um the counter argument would be that didn't necessarily work against Wales and Warren Gatland in in 2015 or, or 2019? Yeah, I think, look, he's the standout candidate. Um, and, yeah, obviously you want to try and keep your own for, for that period of time. But again, it creates an opportunity for someone else to pop up and develop that kind of longer term coaching ticket, you know, out past, um, you know, the next World Cup and beyond by, by someone stepping up into it. Uh, I think it's a good thing. 
Um, you know, he is he's going to do a brilliant job. He knows the Lions. He's been on tours before. He knows the difficulty of getting those rooms together, um, you know, and, and, and he seems to have an incredible kind of emotional intelligence of how to bind a group. And that's exactly what the Lions, you know, what the Lions need. Um, yeah, like, look, he'll be sorely missed from an Irish perspective to the time that he's gone. But, you know, I, I I think it's a good thing and it's it's always good when you know one of your own coaches gets you know gets notoriety for what they've done over the last number of years and takes that next step to the next level and that's the highest level in in our game um be it as a player or a coach so yeah I think it's I think it's only a good thing how do you feel about it Birch from a, a purely selfish and Irish point of view I actually think it's good I think it's good it's good for everybody he gets exposed to different players, different coaches. He gets that little bit of a mental break because he's been with this Irish team um, for quite a while now and as obviously head coach for, for four years. And, and I think mentally it'll be, it'll be really good for him. It'll give us... Um, he'll come back with new ideas uh, or reconfirm you know, his own philosophy is, is the way forward. Um, and the assistant coach he leaves behind you know, one of them will get a chance to show that they're his successor. Um. So yeah, I, I and no, I I think it's a it's a really good thing when you when you've had if, he, if it was his first cycle, I wouldn't be in favor of it. Yeah. If he just joined us after the World Cup, I, I don't think that that's ideal. But the fact he's already been through two World Cup cycles, one as an assistant, and one as a, a head coach, um, and it gives Paul O'Connell, Andrew Goodman, Simon Easterby, whoever takes on that extra responsibility. Um, it gives them a year to, to try it and see see if they're good and see see if they're a viable option to replace him when he eventually leaves. Right, moving on. Munster away to Toulon on Saturday afternoon in the Investec Champions Cup. Before we get into the game itself, lads, there's it seems to be there's transfer news week on week with Munster. Confirmation on Monday that Joey Carberry will leave for France at the end of the season. Strongly linked with Bordeaux. That's where we all believe he's going. Johnny, is it an understandable move um, from all parties, I suppose, really, given how uh, Jack Crowley has, has moved ahead of Joey in the last 12 months, how he's fallen out of favour with Ireland, that he was probably going to move on at some point? Yeah, look, I think it gives Joey an opportunity to kind of refresh his mind and get stuck into something new. Um, just overall feeling around this has just has been one of disappointment um, for everyone involved, be it Munster and him in particular. It was probably outside of RJ Snayman recently, the biggest kind of talked about transfer within kind of the Irish model of moving someone of that, um, you know, of where he was within an Irish setup to another uh, competing province, uh, to a rival province. And for reasons outside of his control, he hasn't been able to really kind of kick on. And that that's really frustrating for kind of both sides and particularly for him personally. Um, and look, there's an opportunity to sam sample a new lifestyle. Um, you know, if it is Bordeaux to go, there's an Irish coach there in Noel. And, you know, they're building something very very big and there's an opportunity of silverware and probably to compete at a European level for him. So fair play to him. Um and you know I think it's it's only a good thing for for him personally. But you know overall I think probably just frustration from both sides that it didn't necessarily work out again for just something that was out out of his control um with injuries and it's sad when someone with such talent doesn't get a fair crack at it and doesn't doesn't get a really good run of games. Um and then obviously, you know, it comes down to, you know, without being too cutthroat, it does for an organization comes down for bang for your buck too as well. And, you know, did they get what they what 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 they needed out of them? Injuries would say they didn't. And that's that's frustrating from their side. So yeah, look, and Jack has has really stood up to the marker over the last kind of eighteen months to two years. So you know, I'm the, uh, 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 you know they'll part they'll part on good terms, I'm sure, um, and hopefully he can get back and have you know some involvement and get Munster back, back you know firing over the next kind of four or five five months before he leaves and he finishes on a high. And Bert, on the go ahead, yeah. 
if you thought the RG Snyman to Leinster controversy was bad, wait till you hear when Joey Carby signs for Leinster. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm joking that would... I think you're, Mike, Mike Prendergast in fairness yesterday he, he kept saying France when he was talking about it but... yeah, I'm, 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 only, I'm only messing that would be that would be wouldn't be worth it wouldn't, it wouldn't be worth it but um, uh, yeah look at uh, it's pretty obvious that Munster unfortunately have to cut costs too you know um, when you when you hear you know the situation with Peter and Connor and Killer the contracts potentially and not being sorted out, and then obviously, you know, they, you know, Joey, Joey leaving. Um, that's a lot of, that's a lot of salary. That's a lot of wages. Um, that obviously, Peter and Connor were on national contracts, so, um, that wasn't affecting them. But for if they stay, it will affect them. So they're obviously yeah. trying to manage the books a little bit better. Sorry, not better. They're trying to manage the books. Um, as best they can. As best they can, and and you can't have a if you don't have a lot of money, you don't have resources. to answer, have. You can't have Joey as your backup. Realistically, that's just the the, the way it is. And I think Jack has 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 shown uh, like Jack would be pushing for a central contract himself if if everything keeps going the way um, it looks like it's going. Um, but at the moment, he doesn't have one. I don't think. And uh, you know, so then you're looking at contract two tens on on on, on um, strong contracts. And and unfortunately for Munster, it doesn't look like they have the capacity to do that. Or they need to spend the money elsewhere. So mm-hmm. it's, it's tough. It's tough. It's going to be. It's it's mad that they're rebuilding. You know, probably after winning the URC, but that was just the nature of where they were. They probably won that URC quicker than was expected. You know, or, or could have hoped for. But I think Roundtree has to rebuild it, and um, yeah, uh, it's a tough time for him at the moment. You'd be hoping to get something positive out in the next two weeks because just get no break injury wise as well, and obviously trying to trying to to manage a budget and, and build a squad for next year. Yeah, and like the budget thing is is a big part of it where some people might look at it and say, oh, there's Munster letting another another out half go just like they did with Ben Healy last season. But if you look at the, or if you look at what way the, the contracts probably are, it's very, very different things where when Joey Carberry signed his last contract a couple of years ago, he was, I don't know exactly what he was getting, but you have to assume he was getting first choice out half money. And yeah. at the time as well, he was he was the incumbent for Ireland. He was it was probably quite a good contract that he was on, and Munster have to spread that out elsewhere. On on how they go about replacing him, Birch. Um, like what what do they need? Like they have Jack Crowley, who is who looks like the long term option at number ten. They have Tony Butler as well, who's another decent young prospect. Uh, can you see them trying to go down the? experience non-Irish qualified route not necessarily like a, a world beater of an out half but someone who who can take on the brunt of 15 to 18 games a season when the likes of Jack Crowley is going to be away with Ireland and, and not available or can you see them trying to pick around you know potentially trying to pick around someone who surplus the requirements at Leinster well, look at Leinster have four haven't they Leinster have four if you include Frawley so the two Burns Frawley and, and Sam um Throw in Charlie Tector as well in the academy. Yeah, five. Sorry, five. Um, four in the running for game time at the moment, I'd say. Yeah. But Charlie, sorry, that's harsh. Charlie, Charlie got some game time last year, so five. Yeah, um, is one of them the right option, or are they just going to say, "Look, at, we're not going to go down that route anymore, where we're we're looking for players from Leinster." Um, and do they go for a Jimmy Gotbert type? Yeah, you know, I was just thinking that he's like, he, he, like not now because he's yeah, still yeah. playing. To be fair to him, but yeah. like Jimmy Gopper type who did a great job for Was Newcastle and uh, did a good job for Leinster. Um, he was somewhere else as well. Uh, he's an axe now, but you know that that type of guy, an experienced player, um, foreigner, uh, and they have a foreign player spot for Snyman. Snyman's uh, foreign player spot. Um, I think. I, I, Look, if they can get one of those five out of Leinster um, who is willing to go and fight with Jack, you know, um, well, I, I would understand that. Um, but if not, I think go get a, a very, very good a 10 because the reality is you can't. It's too hard to expect uh, Tony Butler and and Jack um, to, to carry that weight. Yeah, and Johnny, like we're talking about Jack Crowley just a couple of minutes ago as someone who in the not so distant future could could be moving up onto a central contract at some point. You'd have to assume that 
the amount of time he'll be available for Munster throughout the season is going to be dwindling as of next season. Yeah, um, I think they need to go down kind of that experience route, really. Like, do they want, you know, one of the four guys there outside of Ross, who's probably first choice when fit, you know, they're all younger guys. So you're going to have three young tens then if they do go down that route, which is which is hard. Do they go after kind of someone like Billy Burns, who is um, not him, but someone like that in England that is potentially IQ that they can bring in um, or... Is it the likes of, you know, an, um, a South African or Kiwi 10 that doesn't have the probably level that they can get, head to Japan um, or so that they're, but they can come get, a, you know, a decent, um, you know, a decent contract potentially looking at, you know, looking at what they can do in Europe and try to win some stuff. I think for me, that's where, and, and that person that is an international that has, you know, maybe, 10 to 15 caps for their country can really add something within the environment that um can bring even the likes of you know jack forward because of the experience they have and someone like butler can really really learn off um for me that would be that would be kind of the he'd be kind of the the solution to the problem that's there at the moment in the short term and we're finally moving on to the the games this weekend now um Toulon away, like themselves, uh, Birch, Toulon, two two games without a win. Toulon have lost both. Obviously, Munster have drawn one of those. Peter Romani, Carberry, Niall Scannell potentially back. How do you rate Munster's chances? Um, good. Oh, oh they, they, look, they've always been able to, sorry, they've normally been able to up it in Europe, obviously, Bayonne and Exeter. Um, in fairness, I don't think it's extra. They played a lot of good rugby, just had a bad fun quarter. They're backs to the wall. They put themselves into an awful position, um, and I would, I would fancy them to to get out of there. I watched Toulon play Montpellier the weekend, the top fourteen. Montpellier were bottom. They are still are bottom, but Toulon didn't fire a shot. They were really, really disappointing. Um, so yeah, I, I think Munster can get a get a win there. Um, it's a star to the Toulon team um, on paper. They should win, but I, I I'd be disappointed if Munster don't uh, pull something out of the, out of um the bag and and uh show show why they are one of the you know the the hardest opponents in in the European Cup. Yeah, Johnny. From the like, I've only seen bits and pieces of Toulon this season. I can't really get my head around them because for for what they have and the the players, when you look at that squad list, it just doesn't seem to be to be matching up with with what they're putting out on the pitch. Yeah, they're kind of stereotypical French at the moment. You look at their away form. Um, you know, they've I think they've won one of their last four away games. Um, and that would be the only thing that I'd worry about is that with the who they have, they're at home. It's Munster. It's a game that you know the Toulon crowd will will really enjoy because of the history. Um, it's a difficult place to go, but you know it is. It's do or die for Munster. Um, you know they have to put in a performance. They have to get something out of this game to get into the knockout stages. So, yeah, you'd hope that it's going to be a really tight one. But you hope that Munster have enough grit to 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 pull it out out of the bag the last kind of 10, 15 minutes. Did you play? Did you play over there with Munster? Yeah, I'm we trying to over, remember so. back to that game to go yeah, yeah, heavy we enough defeat. Yeah, yeah, we went over. We were in the game for kind of the first 10, 15 minutes. They again, like Paul Saki and those guys, um, kind of the English kind of Exodus guys had had gone over and were playing there. And um, yeah, the last kind of 15, 20 minutes wasn't a was an enjoyable experience. Great place to play, uh, incredible crowd. Um, it was rocking that day, but um, yeah, it was a long journey home from the south of France that day. Yeah, hopefully a bit quieter uh, this Saturday. So that's Saturday 3.15. Um, I'll skip on to, to Ulster now. Ulster hosting Toulouse Saturday night. Birch, three wins in a row against good opposition. Some people thought we were a little bit negative about them last week on the pod after the, the win against Leinster. This, though, is a is a massive, massive opportunity for them to to back up what we've seen over these, these last few weeks in terms of results. And, like... I think if they if they if they were to pull it off against us or, or to, against Toulouse, which they have come close on, in in the last few years on a, on a couple of occasions, like this is a a big chance to, I don't want to say like announce themselves as contenders or something because it's still very very early in a competition, but to 
to show to everyone that they can back up the big performances week on week. Yeah, I think this is huge for them. I mean, like great performance against Racing, um, not so good against Connacht the week after, and came in like very much underdogs against Leinster, um, but put together a, a really good performance. And uh, that Stephen Kitchoff was at that thing last night, and he, he was saying that you know when he signed for Ulster and when he talked to Dan, Dan was saying, "Look, you know, we're we're kind of." We're not a million miles away. We're we're used to getting to playoffs, but we need to find just that little bit extra to, um, to go and win a trophy, to go win a URC like like the Stormers have done, like Munster have done, etc. So, his role is to to try and help them get there on and off the field, and and uh, I think, you know, they got massive belief out of that Leinster game because they just saw a few things in the Leinster defence, um, and went after it and executed it, and obviously got three tries as a result of it, and. Uh, and then they defended for their lives as well and um, showed lots of grit. And he was telling me that the, the Toulouse game sold out the next morning. So basically, because they beat Leinster, obviously, look, Ravenhill have a very loyal fan base. But just that extra bit of belief and hype um, helped sell out Ravenhill quite quickly. And now all, all the players are talking about how good is it going to be, you know, hosting Toulouse in, in Ravenhill. And... Um, they've done a great job on a on a star sort of French team against Racing, and they'll be just you know they're actually really excited about this opportunity, and I think that's they maybe didn't have that excitement, you know they seem to be just sleepwalking a little bit through the competition in the early rounds of the URC, but that Leinster win hopefully has given them that bit of life and stimulus and confidence to to go and um, play and look at I I, I think. Certainly hope you we weren't harsh on Ulster. It was a phenomenal win. But I suppose when a team gets beaten for the first time in a long time at home, um, you kind of examine that more so. Uh, but absolutely, Ulster fans are right. Um, they deserve massive credit for for how they took apart that, that Leinster team. It was interesting, actually. Uh, Khaleesi last night spoke about Nina Barr. Because obviously, what Ulster did was they identified some of the little... Areas of weakness and and exploited it. And um, the question is, what does Jack do? Does he, you know, does he does he give a little bit um, and and be patient, or does he stick with what he what he believes is the best way to defend? And and it was interesting. Uh, Khaleesi told a story of Nina Barr's first ever game for the Springboks 2018, and they're playing England. And again, he brought in that rush defense, um, and they can see the three tries after ten minutes. So it was. 21 nil, whatever. And at halftime, Nina Barr's message was don't stop getting high. Don't stop being um uh being incredibly aggressive with your uh defense. And if I see anyone stop it, I'm taking you off. It wasn't look at we need more time to train, um, we need to adapt it, we just use the touchline. It was literally look, this is what we're gonna do, and we're gonna if we get hurt, we get hurt, but we learn from it. Um and obviously, you know. 2019, they won a World Cup, but mainly around defence, and he hasn't looked back since. So, I don't think Leinster Leinster will see that as a, actually a a really good lesson. Obviously, they lost uh, what three points um, in uh, they got a bonus point, I think. Yeah, so they lost three points um, in the game or in the league. But if it helps them actually understand the system better, well, then it's actually uh, better to happen now than knock at rugby. Yeah, yeah. And I think Go ahead. Like in terms of um, you know, Ulster's tactic there, like you know, like kicking the ball is still a it's can be a 50-50. You have to be so accurate in that time, in that move, and the conditions lend it lent itself to that being a possibility. Um, where you know, defensively, if you can get really high and aggressively off the line and a kick, it comes down to a bounce of the ball, 50-50. You know, like everything is that gonna happen again where we are going to, you know, where Leinster are going to, you know, where your team is like, oh, well, they're going to land everything on a sixpence every time they kick the ball. And I don't think it's, you know, it's it was just one of those nights that everything stuck for them. And that, that was it. And probably for me and the thing, they're probably, their two guys in the backfield could probably have a bit more, a bit more movement, particularly to the 15, to stop those kind of cross fields maybe, or even just getting in the 10s and high line, that will create a bit more doubt. Um, but outside of that, I don't see why they would they would change much. That's going to happen every now and again where a team just sticks absolutely everything. 
on Leinster then hosting Stadford on say Saturday evening, heading up around forty thousand tickets sold. Game is live on RT two and RT player as well, and on RT RT radio. Two out of two for Leinster so far in this pool, Birch. And given Stade Francais are bottom of this pool and are going quite well in the top 14, um, are we expecting Stade Francais to leave a few of the big guns at home this weekend? Yeah, I think so. I think so. This should be one-way traffic for, for Leinster. Although defensively, Paul Gustard, the former Saracens and England defence coach, is, is there now and he's done a good job with them. Um they probably won't roll over as, as as badly as they may have in the past. Um, I think they're starting to get a bit more uh, consistency. But no, I, I don't think they'll see a realistic chance of beating Leinster and may rest up for the week after the home game and, and top 14 to come. So you'd expect Leinster to bounce back pretty well. That week off was probably a good timing for them. Um, and I'd expect them to come out bouncing. And I, I think we said it after the first two rounds, Johnny, maybe they mightn't get as, as big a challenge this year, but certainly in the first two rounds, they got a better challenge in the pool stage than they had in, in previous years. You know, away to La Rochelle first up, where um, I suppose the result was a lot more important than the performance, and they got that. And then the following week against Sale, where the performance wasn't great, but Sale caused them plenty of trouble. And hopefully from a Leinster point of view, going through a few teething problems in this middle point of the season will stand to them a little bit better come April or May when they want to be peaking rather than, rather than in previous years where they just kind of blew teams apart on a, on a weekly basis and, and ran out of steam a bit by the end of this, of the campaign. Yeah. I think coming in after that loss from Ulster will really concentrate the mind um, that, you know, and going into a big two week block ahead of the internationals where, um, you know, guys, a, a huge amount of guys are going to be gone. Um, but this is something that they need to, you know, go out, put a performance in, and 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 really kick on. You know, they'd be looking at five points here, which would probably guarantee them, you know, um, qualification. And then it's it's they kick on, but everything is an opportunity for them to grow and learn, as Bert has already said. Um, you know, around solving those teething issues in the in defense that they had against Ulster, there would have been a lot of work on that. Again, the Aviva full house, like fair play to them, you know, get they'll be close to that kind of 45 50 marker by the end of the week. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd expect a really big performance from for a couple of reasons. I think backlash and also another two weeks under Neon Bar terms of learning and getting up to speed with everything that he's trying to bring in defensively, I think it's going to be, you know, they're going to get better and better every week. For, in my opinion, Lencer, because it's another week under Jack and, and it'll keep moving and keep moving. Finally then, Connacht against Leon on Saturday as well. Um, Connacht's in a funny situation here now, Birch, where they, they got back on track in the URC. Obviously, they've two defeats out of two in the Champions Cup, but if they can pull off two big results here over the, the next two weeks, They'd, you'd assume any of they're going to be going through to a, to a last 16. Given the fact that they don't have a URC game until the middle of February, they're probably not in a situation where they might think, OK, we, we can kind of throw the Champions Cup away and put all our eggs into a, a URC game in a couple of weeks' time. They have nothing really to, to rest up for at this point. Do you expect them to to throw everything they have against Leon and see what sticks yeah. this weekend? Yeah, and it's a winnable game um, because Leon are second from bottom. Uh, so a club that has started to get used to being top six and actually Ryan, um, they had a home quarter final last year uh, in the in the in the playoffs and, and lost it, and that led to Xavier Garbajos actually being sacked, and and um, it's been a disastrous start for them. Um, and yeah, now they'll be totally focused on staying up. Um, because Montpellier have sacked their coaches and they they're on a bit of a of a run. They've won two of the last three, um, and aren't a million miles behind them. So the the teams that people expected to get relegated, Bayonne and Perpignan have, are ahead of Montpellier and Lyon, and obviously there's lots of time for for those clubs to to catch up. But that that will be Lyon's um, focus one million percent. So if Connacht can um get into them uh and I think they'll be happy defensively how they played against against Munster. And sorry, just again I, I got criticized um a feedback it's not criticism feedback that I was un ungracious about Connacht's win against Munster and that I, I accused them of cheating. Um 
I actually admire what they did uh, around the breakdown. I think it was really smart, really shrewd. shrewd. Um, the reason was more evident, and I, it was actually effect, it happened both sides of the ball, and um, and Connacht actually because of that switched into a kicking game much earlier than Munster did, and and you can be hypercritical of Munster and say they overplayed because there was nothing to be gained from from having a high rook rate, um, given the ball was so slow, whereas Connacht didn't persist with that. Um, my argument, my, my the reason I was focused on the Connacht side slowing the ball down and effectively cheating as such was they had way more defensive rooks than Munster because Munster overplayed, um, yeah. so it was more obvious. Um, but I thought it was very shrewd by Fardy and 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 Connacht to push that to the absolute limit of the law, and that that's why I I I I feel and I, um and I wrote in the Sunday Independent that referees need to stop coaching that and let that happen, you know, um, and the penalised players who are flirting with the laws um, around the breakdown. But no, Connacht, Connacht will get massive game for that. Connacht's best um, form of, or best style, or at their very best, they are attacking. And unfortunately, because of the, the weather in Ravenhill, even though they did, they scored a couple of good tries, but particularly the weather in, in, in the sports ground, um, and said the breakdown um, meant that they couldn't get into their flow. Whereas I think the French, what I've seen in Leon, they're not really that bothered about slowing down the rook ball as much as other teams. And they may get some quick ball and they may be able to, uh, to challenge them and, and, and get to get back to where they were the first four rounds when I thought their attack was as good as any team in Ireland. Um, but obviously since then, a little bit of a drop off in performance levels and worsening weather conditions. Um, they've struggled to really find their flow. Yeah, Johnny, artificial pitch there in Leon as well, so that plays into their hands. Yeah, I was just about to ask. Yeah, so it's a four G. So that'll if they can get quick rock ball on on that. Um, you know, four G just lightning quick, and I think that suits their style of play. Um, and then just on Birch's thing, as Leon Lloyd used to always say, it's only cheating if you get caught. So like <laughs> you know, they're getting away with it. So, um, you know, and that's what professional sports people have to do and rugby have to push the push those lines um as hard as you can and particularly for a team that um you know that want to play fast and quick like Connacht they have to do everything they can at breakdown to ensure that the ball is quick um and then obviously defensively slow down teams so that um you know be it a half a second slower rolling towards the nine not being north south being east west you know those those types of thing make a make a big big difference or when you're rolling holding on to the um you know holding on to the tackler and forcing him to have that extra roll before he places all those things make a huge huge difference and in conditions like they had against Munster that can win you a game which it did so um yeah it was just smart um for me but I do think that if they can get good weather over there on a 4G um and you know with Leon in the position there and they're going to be really concentrating on what's next in the top 14 to stay up and then and so they have a have a good opportunity to get in and then you know Bristol at home that could be a cracker two teams that like to play um but yeah they I I think they can they can put in a good show this weekend and and you know they could even get five points if they if they get into their attacking straps like they did at the start of the season okay so that is leon hosting connick this saturday afternoon 1 p.m uh 3 15 is the kickoff time for toulon against munster at 5 30 it's leinster hosting stad francais at the Aviva stadium live on rt2 and rt player and on rt radio as well and then 8 p.m kickoff at kingspan stadium ulster taking on toulouse fellas that's where we will leave it for this week. Thanks to, to Birch and Johnny as usual. Thank you. And we'll see you again soon.